Hello, and welcome to the Current Science and Technology Podcast from the Museum of Science in Boston. I'm your host, Susan Heilman, and every week we bring you interviews with guest researchers and our museum staff covering science and technology in depth. 80% of deaths on the battlefield occur due to bleeding or blood loss. Therefore, it seems that the most important step medically is to stop the bleeding and as quickly as possible. Here to talk about her lab's work on an impressive new bio bandage is Dr. Paula Hammond, a chemical engineer at MIT. Hi, Dr. Hammond. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thanks for joining me here. So before we get into the benefits of your particular bandage, what are some of the current ways that they try to stop bleeding on the battlefield and then what are those shortcomings and then we'll of course get into how your bandage is better than that. Excellent. Well, there's the oldest way known in history, which is the tourniquet which uh, for those of you who had first aid a long time ago, it essentially involves tying off the source of blood above the wound and essentially making a very tight wrap around that. That often causes loss of limb and it can only be applied to limbs. It won't work on the neck or the mm, head. Probably not. Or the chest. Right. Uh, now there, the next level up, uh, the, the Army has actually been using a quick clot powder. Mm -hmm. It's actually a ceramic powder that when added to a bleeding wound will absorb a lot of the water that's part of the blood plasma and that causes your blood platelets to aggregate and clot. The problem here is that it also releases a lot of heat while it's absorbing that water. And that leads to first, second, and sometimes even third degree burns. So the soldier may live, but with a huge amount of tissue damage. And finally, uh, more recently, there have been bandages made of a material known as chitosan. This uh, material is something that comes from the shells uh, of lobsters and shrimp. And in that case, it takes a lot of money to purify this chitosan. So it's a fairly expensive bandage, and it's also very stiff and non-compliant. So it doesn't easily apply to all wounds. I mean, it tends to be effective in some cases and not in others. Okay, so it sounds like there's a couple different choices, but none seem perfectly ideal. So now your bandage is trying to be able to do all these different things, fit in, in all different places, stop the bleeding quickly. So what exactly is your bandage? Our bandage actually consists of uh, a gelatin sponge onto which we use a water-based process to coat a natural protein called thrombin. That thrombin protein actually is part of the clotting cascade. We want to put a lot of thrombin into the sponge and that's a challenge because we really want to coat the inside of the sponge without changing the way the sponge functions. So why not just soak the sponge in some thrombin? If you just soak the sponge in thrombin, you'll have something that will work on a surgical table. And in fact, that's exactly what they do in surgeries. But they can actually make up their nice, clean solution of thrombin there. That solution of thrombin is going to only be good for a couple of hours. Okay. So you can't send the soldier out with a solution of thrombin that's going to be good. Right, so he'd, ha he'd have his jar of thrombin in one hand and a sponge in the other, and then he'd have to dip it in and soak it and then apply it. Exactly. So then the question is, how do we get thrombin into the sponge in a way that allows us to have a dry, very thin coating with a lot of thrombin and still have the sponge have the holes and pores in it that allow it to act like a sponge? Right. And what we do is we actually take that thrombin and we build a layer of it, just a molecular scale layer, and then we alternate that layer with tannic acid, which is this very natural compound that's found in tea and in some wines. Wines. So I was going to say a lot of times you're thinking about the tannin count in them. That's right. right. Tannins are good for you. They are actually anti-inflammatory. Oh. They, yeah, so they can actually help with wound healing. And so it's actually a, a side benefit from using this approach. So we actually build these layers with thrombin, the clotting protein, and tannic acid, this natural anti-inflammatory molecule, layer by layer. And the more layers we put down, the more thrombin we get into the sponge. The way that we do this allows us to coat the insides of the sponge without filling it up so we still have holes in the sponge. Right, because you're talking about on the nano layer, on a very, very tiny layer, and you can have many nano layers and not even see it at all. Exactly, and that's really the importance of using nano technology to do this. We're actually putting down nano layers of protein and alternating it with these nano layers of tannic acid. These layers are so thin that it doesn't change the function of the sponge at all. In fact, if you look at the sponge, it looks the same before and after you coat it. 
Now, why the tannic acid? You said that the anti-inflammatory is kind of a, a, a side bonus. Why use it otherwise? It turns out that if I just put down thrombin by itself, I'm only going to get one molecular layer to stick and to stay there and allow me to manipulate the material. So after that, you have a very small amount of loading of thrombin in the sponge, not enough to really be effective. You want to put a lot of thrombin into the sponge. Now, tannic acid, hydrogen bonds with thrombin, and that's the same interaction that holds DNA together, that holds a number of the natural things in life together. It's strong enough to allow us to build these layers. Uh, the layers are stable, but when they see water in the blood, they actually begin to come apart and they release the thrombin. Oh, okay, so it's not even that it's the sponge itself coated with the thrombin, but it allows the release of thrombin into the body. That's exactly right. Okay. What we're doing is releasing the thrombin to the wound very rapidly when it sees blood. And as soon as you get that sponge touching blood, you release thrombin and you start that clotting cascade that allows the bleeding to stop. And then the sponge can also soak up some of the blood because otherwise the thrombin would just touch the blood. But the fact that it's a sponge is you can get a lot more surface area, a lot more of the blood touching the sponge. That's right. There are a couple of advantages to using a sponge. One of them is that the sponge itself is really absorbent. The sponge that we're using is a gelatin sponge that is already manufactured by a company called Ferrison, and it absorbs 10 times its weight in, in water or blood. Now, when you absorb water from the bloodstream, again, it causes your, your blood platelets to aggregate, and that helps to begin the clotting process. Then the second advantage is that sponges have a lot of holes, and therefore they have a lot of area. Right. So we can pack a lot of this nano layer into the sponge, which means huge amounts of thrombin we can put in. That means that when this sponge is exposed to a wound, we get a lot of thrombin coming out and a lot of blood being soaked up. And the combination of those two actions gives us a very effective way of, of stopping the bleeding. So this sounds like a great solution for being used on the battlefields. Has it been used in battle yet? Has it been used on battlefields? Or where is it in the, in the kind of approval process? Right now, we're still in the testing phase. We have to test it first with animals and then get FDA approval so that it can be tested in clinical situations before it can go out on the battlefield. One big advantage is that thrombin and the tannic acid are already FDA approved. So we think it's going to be very simple to get it through the FDA approval process. Great. So a couple of logistic questions. How big are the sponges? How fast does it, you say it works fast, but how fast does it work? Yes, uh, the sponges themselves, the ones we work with are about the size of a deck of cards. You can make them any size that you want, uh, but the practical size is about the size of the palm of your hand down to the size of the deck of cards and it's about that thick. Uh, it acts very rapidly, usually in the first uh, 10 to 20 seconds, you can oh, begin wow. to see some effect, and certainly within the first minute. Wow, okay, so that definitely qualifies as fast. To make this the most effective possible, is there anything more you can add, or is all you need the thrombin and the tannic acid, is there anything else that could make this an even better product? Actually, we're very interested in antibiotics because when the soldiers out there with huge wounds uh, in the battlefield in a number of different regions, there are bacteria available. Many of them are bacteria we're not familiar with, and we want to treat that wound with an antibiotic right away. So what type of antibiotic would you use in this situation? I mean, you have to be careful if people are penicillin, you know, allergic to penicillin, so what, what did you choose to use? We actually chose to use vancomycin, which is this very broad spectrum antibiotic that can treat many different kinds of bacteria. Well, when do you see this actually being used for the battlefield when you get, when you finish a lot of the study, the clinical trials and um, you get approval for it? When can we expect to see this um, for our soldiers? If everything runs along smoothly, then I would anticipate we could have something that's available in four or five years. But right now we're talking with the company that manufactures the gelatin sponge and they seem very interested in moving forward to next steps. One thing that's especially exciting about the work is that, although we're developing it for battlefield use, this is the same kind of technology that could be transferred to civilian use. So we actually see this as something that might be useful for first responders, oh, or yeah. people who are working on ambulances and emergency care rooms, firemen, and ultimately it might be adapted to be used by surgeons in a more routine use. Oh, right, yeah. I mean, if this is something that's more simplistic, and less harmful to be able to use, then yeah, why not use it wherever it's possible? Yes. Great, it sounds very promising, and I really appreciate you coming in here talking to me about this. Thank you very much.
that's it for this week's show, but be sure to come back next time for more of the latest in science and technology. This podcast is a production of Current Science and Technology at the Museum of Science in Boston, part of the Boston community for over 175 years. For more information, visit our website at www.mos.org slash CST or email us at podcast at mos.org. Thanks for listening.